Anthony, it's about time on this podcast we're making waves. What do you think? You know, let's make some waves. I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Lives. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey everybody, welcome to No Vacancy Live. That's Anthony Nimelkiri. I am Glenn Hausman. We're so excited you chose to spend some time with us today. And Anthony, today's going to be a fun one because we're doing something a little bit different, which always gets me happy. Which, what is it that we're doing different? <laughs> yeah, we're going to be talking to uh, an old friend of yours who's been uh, making waves in the cruise business for 40 years and has just put out a new book talking all about that. And what I really like is learning about people's challenges, their struggles, the adversity, the things that they had to overcome to become a fully formed human being and professional. We don't talk about those things enough. And it always seems that like executives come out of nowhere and they never had any struggles. So it'll be fun to get a real story today, I think. You, you know, I, I've been saying my favorite quote lately is slow is fast. And it reminds me of, of Lisa. And so we'll talk more about that is that you know, she may have struggles, but it, it never, it, she's flawless. So it always looked flawless. So, anyway, so uh, let's get to it. Let's bring her on. All right, let's do it. Lisa Luta Hello, <laughs> Vice Chairman, Royal Caribbean Group. It is so great to see you, Lisa. Thanks for joining well, us today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with the two of you, two of my favorite people in the world. Thank you for having me. Well, thank well, you, thank you for, for being on. Yeah, so I'll get it started because I know you two are old friends and I'm going to be left out for most of this conversation. I've already made peace with it and I'm okay, but uh, I, I would love to know, Lisa, just to get started, um, why decide to write this book now? Well, first of all, now just is sort of the natural uh, time frame in which it happened. I've been working on that book for six years and I started... Uh, let me just say that making waves in this book is just like so many other things in my career. I never thought I would be a published author. It was never in my realm of thinking or possibilities. And so many people told me I needed to write a book. And so I did. And uh, here it is. It started six years ago. We had a little time out with COVID. And um and now finally, it's uh, launching as we speak, and it's really exciting. Well, I'll tell you, I was very blessed. You know, I received your manuscript, what was it, about a year ago? Yeah, well, a little less. But yeah, when I asked you to write the testimonial, you said, please send me the manuscript. So I did. And it was, yeah, a little less than a year ago, Anthony. So I read the manuscript, and um I, I should say the book is out now, available in places such as Amazon.com. Go get yourself a copy. Yeah. Right now. yeah. Well, is it available right now or is it available on the 20th? It's for sale right now, and they'll get it on the 20th. Okay. And just so everybody knows, this is going to be airing after the 20th. So it is on sale right now. I'm good at this, aren't I? And <laughs> um, and uh, so I remember I was working out in my, in my yard, and – I, I was whatever I was doing, I was on the bike and I was reading it or whatever. And I go to my uh my my lounge and I'm reading it. And uh as soon as I put the book down, what happened, Lisa? You hit the record button and you sent me this video that made me cry. And um, you know, I I knew that you wanted to read the manuscript in order to write a testimonial, and I truly respected that, but you knew me really well, and I didn't think you needed to, but no, you wanted to read the manuscript. And when you write a book, you always hope it's going to evoke a certain feeling in people, which is why you write it. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about this, but this was a very personal book for me. It was a very vulnerable book. It was a very honest book, Glenn, to your point. You know, I've read leadership books that are so prescriptive and everybody makes it seem like it's so easy. And I wanted people to know that it wasn't. I started at the bottom. I went to the top. It was really cool, but it took a long time and it was messy along the way. And I wanted yeah to be real. And so when you read that manuscript and you sent me that video of your immediate reaction, you, because you had just finished it, 
Um, and you were filled with such emotion. And the things that you said, Anthony, were more beautiful than I could have ever imagined. And as you know, we both posted those because they were so special to me. And I asked your permission, but um, I couldn't have asked for a better reaction to the book if I tried. Well, you know, as you know, it was heartfelt because one thing I am is authentic. And um, if it wasn't great, I was like, hey, great book. <laughs> <laughs> I know that about you, and that's why it was even more special that you didn't say, oh, yeah, great book. It was, you know, this is what I live my life for. I live my life to learn something and to feel something I haven't felt before. Like when I was running the Algonquin, you know, the Oak Room, the, the beautiful jazz club that was there, I, I told everybody, the people come in this room, you know, they sold it, they bought it, they invented it. You're not going to impress them. You got to make them feel something. You know, whether through song, through emotion, something, through movement, you got to make them feel something. So I don't really read leadership books. I've read maybe two in my whole life. I think the last one I wrote, read was Andy Grove's Intel, you know, uh, why he put the Intel sticker on all the computers. And he said, because, and he said, I go, I'm not paranoid in my personal life, but I'm paranoid in my professional life. And that was like, I was a young manager. And I, and I remember like Jesus came down and like said, okay, you're okay now. You're allowed <laughs> to be paranoid. And so, cause I'm paranoid person in business, meaning I don't want my competition to beat me. Right. Yeah. So, so that was the last book I read. And wow. cause I always said, if you can't write them, you shouldn't read them. So then I did, I wrote one, which is more of my story, not really a leadership book, but then I read yours. And what yours was to me was, can you hear my dog in the background, by the way? I hope not. I okay. So what, what yours was to me was it was messy, but it was neat, which means Yes, this is messy, but it doesn't look messy. It doesn't feel messy because we're going to move forward. We're going to figure it out. You're going to listen. I'm going to listen to you. And if you don't want to listen, you know, have a nice day. Um, we love you, but you got to go. There was no, like, there was, there was just steadiness. When you're running a floating resort, there's no time for getting overly emotional it's your it's it's serious and so i really felt that leadership that was very steady very fierce but very elegant that's the word i'm looking for it was elegant leadership and i i've rarely ever seen that before and you know you always like i said in my testimony you're on the edge right obviously you know uh, literally because you 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 that was the whole concept and you can talk more about that in a second so it was just, it was just magical to me. It was just like, I wish that I had a good career. I had a good career, but I'm an emotional guy. And it was a little like some people saw the mess and I would imagine your elegance just made it all kind of fierce, but you know, a little bit tidier than, than, and, and, and everybody I know that knows you says that you're an insane leader and you don't get that very often anymore. It's so funny you use the word elegant. I think I told the story in the book where, you know, I was told no three times um, before I was finally given uh, my CEO, president and CEO of celebrity position. And I was I was I was not happy about that. I was quite irritated by it. I was disappointed in it and I couldn't understand why you know, my boss at the time didn't, would have, would have been my boss, uh, didn't think I was ready, but, and I let him know exactly how I felt. And, but he always said to me afterwards, the way I handled that was one of the reasons why he ended up finally appointing me to the position. And that while I was very honest and spoke my mind, I did it in a very elegant way. I was always very elegant when I was not happy about something. And the fact that you use that word is really so interesting to me because he, he said the same thing to me. And um, yeah, you know, so we all have our style and I love your messy style and it's what's worked so well for you. And it's like, you're so just honest and out there. And, and my style was pretty much, yeah, you, we're, we're going to do this and I hope you come along with me. And if you don't, that's your decision. But, but I tried to do it in a really elegant way. And uh, sales is in my blood as it is in yours. So I always tried to sell my ideas and my vision so people would jump on willingly. Yeah, you know, and, and it's not a female executive book. It's an executive book. It's a young man can read it, an old man can read it, a young man. This is, you had one of the 
premier jobs in all of travel. And it's, 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 that's what I kind of want to make sure that is out there. This isn't a female executive book for females. This is an executive book. This is a new way of doing it. And if you're not bringing, everybody talks about it. You really want to get me heated up. Everybody talks about bringing people together. Everybody talks about culture. Everybody talks about, you know, uh, we're, we're in this together. And then all of a sudden they get slapped in the face and all of a sudden their stress takes over and their bonus takes over and their pension takes over and I'm going to lose my job takes over. The reason you were able to get into that office and, and speak your mind, because you weren't afraid of losing your job. You needed to push your position. And if that for some reason irritated somebody and you were no longer in the company, you could have lived with that, but you could not live with not being honest with yourself or being honest with them. And that's what this book's about. This book is, I always say, get fired doing your job. Don't get fired not doing your job. And, and that was a moment that you were like, you know what, I'm ready for whatever happens, but I can't sleep at night. So this book, um, like I said, I said in the, in the testimonial, it's a new leadership book. So let me ask you this question, uh, at least to get a little context around this uh, three times thing. Over how many years did this take place? I assume it wasn't just one afternoon, right? And, <laughs> And and was there constructive reasons for it or were there systemic reasons for it? Or what was really the issues that you had to personally accept and address and get beyond in order to make that that big achievement? Well, um, it didn't happen over multiple years, but it probably happened over a couple of years. Okay. Um, so and what's really interesting about this is that the positions that I asked for were president and CEO positions. They were of our two different brands, mm -hmm. uh, our two different big brands in our company. And both of those positions were vacated by men who held them. I'm, I'm, I'm only saying that as fact, not. But yeah. I mean, it's not surprising. Not, uh, not, typically yeah. that's the way reality well, has worked. <laughs> well, since I was the first woman president yeah. and CEO, which we talk about in the book of the company, of course they were both men, but they both recommended me for the job and said, you have to put Lisa in this position. She's ready. She's going to be great at it. She helped build these brands, you know, blah, 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 blah. And yet I was still told you're not quite ready. And here's the other thing that I didn't, I didn't get a, I got an answer that you're not ready. Right. And I got an answer that I don't know why you're not ready. I just don't believe you are ready. Oh. And so that's that's what I've tried uh, not to do. And and I, I'm sure there were reasons why it was felt that I wasn't ready. But, but if those you don't know what they are, then you can't learn from that and become a better professional. That mushiness of, I don't know, I don't feel it is not very instructive and helpful to anybody. Well, that's why I tried not to be mushy. I tried to be very constructive in all of my conversations, regardless of what they are. But that yeah. was the reality. And so I just, you know, as I've said so many times in the book, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and said, all right, well, eventually I'm going to change his mind. And eventually I did. And I just kept doing what I do. One of the things I will say, though, is that Another thing I talk about in the book is running your own PR campaign, because what I learned is that doing a great job and getting great results and just keeping your head down, you're going to get recognized and you're going to get what you deserve. And that is not the case. You really do have to figure out who needs to see me, who needs to know about this, who need to, who need, who do I need to be in front of that's ultimately going to make the decision that's going to get me where I want to go. And what I did realize during that time, during that couple of years, is I ended up working much more closely uh, with the with the gentleman who became my boss. He became a mentor to me and he ultimately did help me achieve what I wanted to achieve. So, you know, while he wasn't as specific as I wished he was, while he didn't tell me yes sooner than I wished he did, at least he gave me the opportunity to uh, work very closely with him and he could learn about me. I could learn about him. We could actually yes. learn from each other. And I ultimately got what I wanted. Now, I'm not saying this is in your situation, but one of the things I've learned in life that sometimes a no is better than a yes right away, because maybe you weren't actually ready maybe. for a particular position and you still need to learn things. I know my personal life, that has actually been the case. And I'm glad that the opportunity came along a little bit later when I was actually prepared for it, as opposed to having ego and thinking I was prepared for it. Again, not saying this is what, what your case is, Anthony. So Lisa, if we can back up from the first day 
your professional life. And I mean, it could be literally the first day, you know, in, in co your college job or, and then, you know, in a few minutes, just kind of take us to where, where you know, where, where we are now. Well, I've always been in hospitality, you know, Anthony, like you, that's the, that's the career I chose or it chose me. My parents always owned restaurants. I was working in restaurants very young, six years old. I started on the wow. on a upside down milk crate, making change for coffee to go in my parents' coffee shop. Um, I put myself through school waiting tables in restaurants. I ended up coming out of school, working in hotels in Massachusetts, where I'm from, selling event space, convention space. And it wasn't doing it for me. You know, I felt like the hotels got small after a while. The opportunity wasn't there. I got a little bored. So I was switching jobs every year. And then all of a sudden, I'm laying in bed one Sunday, frustrated with my life and where it was going. I'll date myself and say I was looking at the help wanted section of the Boston Globe that day. And this like opportunity came up working for some travel agency in downtown Boston selling cruises. I'm like, mm -hmm. hell, I know I can sell. I don't know anything about cruising. Hey, sounds interesting. Why not? Um, and so that was my first foray into travel. And then the person who was the sales rep for Royal Caribbean at the time got promoted, came in and said, if any of you are interested in my job, apply, send your resume. I did. And then here I am 39 years later. And that was messy too. They didn't choose me first time. I had to go back and ask again for the job after the guy they hired didn't even make it through his probationary period. But what that says is I am so determined. And to your point, Glenn, as soon as someone tells me no, I just figure out how I'm going to turn it into a yes. I'm like that in my marriage. I'm like that in my life. And I'm like that in my career. Tell me no, and I'm going to turn it into a yes. So it's motivation. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it is. But, you know, and, and unfortunately, I heard a story yesterday similar to what you just said about this young lady's 26 years old. She's unbelievable. Uh, we're working on my new show and she's helping us with social media and stuff. And she gave me a similar story in her last job. And where somebody, there was a, a, a I don't want to give her a name or anything, but she, there was a the difference in wages and, and she was doing the job, whatever. I don't want to go too far into it. Um, but basically she said the same thing and she literally fought against it's because I'm a woman. She's like, it's not because I'm a woman. And then she went back. It's not because I'm a woman. She went back and it's not because I'm a woman. She went back. And then finally she goes, oh, it's because I'm a woman. <laughs> and she was shocked because like she didn't ever experience anything like that. And she realized, and then, you know, so, so to me that this, that happens in your day, it happens, you know, to, uh, it happened to this 26 year old woman and there's, it's unfair, but um, it's not their job to be fair. It is their job to be fair, but it's not going to happen. And it's, you, you don't have to be, again, you don't have to be aggressive, but you have to be, you have to open your mouth and you have to believe in that step. A lot of people take a step and want to go in the right direction. And they know, they don't really know if they're right, but they just want, they just want it. When you have right, when you know you're right and you want it, that's when you win. When you, when you think you're right, but you're not sure, you're not going to win. It's okay not to be prepared a hundred percent, but you right. know, you have to be right. You know, I talk about in my book where I, I guaranteed the headhunter, his executive fee, if I didn't get to my first GM job and I got it and I just knew I was going to get it. Right. I didn't have fifteen thousand dollars to give him. I didn't have fifteen cents to give him, but <laughs> I knew I was I was going to get that job. So, what has been the most shocking thing about getting your book out there? And you've been all over social media. You've done a beautiful job about it. What's been the most surprising thing about your book from the outside? Um. <sighs> It's like, I think for me, it's a job. It's a full-time job. You know, I was like, I was a little surprised by that. I knew I was going to like do things, but, um, you know, if you really want to put it out there and you really want to make a go of it and you really want it to be successful and uh, then you put in the work. And I don't know why that should surprise me because I've done that my entire life, right? I've always been in the work, um, but nothing just comes. And I think that that's, Number one, it was hard to get the book published for a lot of different reasons. So early on, 
you know, Jan Miller from Dupree Miller was my literary agent. I found her again by some coincidental connection I made. She's unbelievably great. And she stuck with me the whole time because she wanted to tell my story. She believed it was a story worth telling. But publishers could have cared less about the cruise industry, didn't know about the cruise industry. What do I care about the industry? Why is it such a big deal? Why is she such a big deal? So we had a hard time farming the book out and I didn't it's want not, to- it's not right, Step right there. Isn't that insane? Yeah. Isn't that insane? Yes. You who are like like <laughs> the, the queen in our industry and you are amazing that, oh, it's not relevant. Everybody likes cruising. Everybody yeah. likes leadership yeah. stories. Everybody maybe likes struggle know. stories. I know. Cruising. I know. Yeah. She's like, maybe we have to write a few pages in the proposal to educate them on the industry. Anyway, then COVID hit. It became a non-issue. Right. Then when we came out of COVID, uh, unfortunately, there isn't anybody on the planet that didn't know about cruising after COVID because and we were everywhere. So I guess there's no such uh, publicity. There's no such thing as bad publicity. Yeah, publicity. Yeah. Right. Right. So everyone knew about the cruise industry. Jan calls and says, "All right, let's get this book back in back in going." So. Um, then finally, um, I found a woman who could help me write, get it into proposal shape. We, she sent it out to publishers. And what I have to say is, got to give my publisher a plug, Ben Bella, Matt Holt, small boutique firm. He used to be in a really big firm, wanted to spin off on his own. He only selects a couple of handfuls of business authors a year to work with. And he okay. wanted to work with me and publish my book. And he's awesome. His team's awesome. But then, okay, you got to promote it. You got to, you know, publicity. You need to, a publicist. So I'm like, holy crap. It was, I learned something new. But again, in my whole life and all my career, I learned something new. But I learned it's not for the faint of heart. Writing a book and getting a book out there into the universe is not for the faint of heart. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, wanted, I, I would like to just take a step back because now what you've told is another story of turning no to yes and a lifelong experience of having grit, right? A lot of our younger viewers and stuff, um, they're still that part of their career where that no intimidates them. How do you have that grit and how do you create it to keep going forward to turn those no's to yes and do it in a way that builds confidence while telling the world they need to pay attention. And if, I, if I can add before you answer that, also, like, talk about when you answer it about being liked, right? Because, oh, they don't like me, so I go away. I don't push. It's like you're, 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 you're feeling they don't like you, so you quit. And that's what I'm finding today is that people are like, oh, they don't like me. They don't care about you to like you. Right. It's like that's a lot of that's a lot of time to like you. So they don't know you. How can they not like you? So so to to his point, how do you just go through that? Uh, well, you're right. They don't need to like you. They need to respect you. They don't need to like you. And I learned that very early. And I know we all know that. Um, listen, it takes practice. And somebody asked me recently about sales. And uh, how important I felt sales was. And oh my God, I cannot tell you how important it is. You're always selling something. Always, always, always an idea, an idea for a new ship. Publish my book, our strategy, our annual operating plan, selling to the board, selling to travel advisors early in my career. And I think rejection is something you need to build a little muscle to be able to manage and be okay with. And so sales is, um, you know, it's incomparable in that regard, but it does take, you know, it, it takes an intentional way of talking to yourself and not letting a no derail you. And it takes courage. And that's, I want to, I'm going to talk about courage because my book is about a woman's rise to the top using smarts and courage. But honestly, courage is a number one at the top of the list because in order to process a no and be willing to turn it into a yes and go right. back at it and try again, you need a tremendous amount of courage. What does the cowardly lion say? I just need courage. Yes, that's and that's the end of my book, right? My analogy with the Wizard of Oz. We're all looking for something. And unfortunately, there's no wizard that's going to give it to you. It's got to come from inside of you. That's just one thing. That's what I was counting on. Yeah. And I also think this is what I said before, which is really important. No one cares, man. No one cares. You're this rock star, but no one cares if your book's successful. No, no one cares the story in your book until you no. let them know the story in your book. That is what 
I had trouble with in my life growing up, you know, in, in this business. And then once I realized that, I was like, oh, they care, but I got to tell them why they should care. What's in it for them? Mm-hmm. You know, what's in it for them if you care? And then they're like, oh, okay, maybe I'll care a little bit. Yeah. And, 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 and right, you can't sell anything unless you convince them there's something in it for them. But the whole emotional connection is really important. And that's why I wanted this book to emotionally connect with people. I wanted them to read this book and say, that's me. I experienced that. I had that happen to me. And to your point earlier, Anthony, this isn't, it was written by a woman. I am a woman, no denying that. I say that in the book. I did accomplish a lot of things as the first woman in our industry because there's so many men in it. It's been male dominated for centuries you know, a century, <clears throat> but I did more for men than I did for women. I'm the poster child for gender equality. But when I stepped down and made the announcement, I think it was April 6th, 2023, my colleague who is the president and CEO of Royal Crib- the Royal Caribbean brand sits just one office away from me and his administrative assistant, executive administrative assistant sits outside of his office. After I made my announcement, it was very emotional for me because I'm like, I put my heart and soul into all of it for so long. I went back into my office and there was a line of people outside of my office to come and see me. And all of them were men. And all of them were sobbing. I mean, sobbing. And when I was finally, you know, talking to each one of them as they came in one by one, Eileen said, I have never seen so many grown men in my life sobbing. And... That well, was crazy. Well, listen, I read your book, and what was I doing? <laughs> you were sobbing, but you, you didn't even work with me. Um, so right, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a cry. It was a sob. <laughs> well, and, and, but you know what's interesting? I think this is important. At that, to, to what you just said, we met because I did. I moderated a panel. Right. Yeah. Was it a Forbes, I think? Forbes yeah. Travel Guide. Yeah. And, and 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 there was a connection on, on 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 stage with you. But I was like, all right, she's busy, she's important. And then my Uber didn't come or my yeah. uh, limo, my, yeah. my car didn't come. And I'm calling the young lady, say, Hey, my car's not here. You know, where do you know where it is? And then all of a sudden you and I start talking and you're like, Hey, I have a car. You want to take a ride to the airport? That was it. That was it. That all was right. it. But because we connected on like everything you were just saying. It's like we were in the moment, we were talking, we understood each other, we understood each other's language. And it was just like, oh, I don't see this very often. I this this is unusual, you know? And then I was like, okay, I just need to kind of stalk her for a while. <laughs> and and I think I stalked you for a while and I like, made you be my friend, and now we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> it did, you didn't have to work that hard to make that happen. <laughs> <Not at all. laughs> so Lisa. Uh, from the day that you started your your career to, to to now, how do you think the world has changed and reshuffled to help young executives of you know different backgrounds, races, genders, and all be able to find the success that you've had? Well, listen, I think it's much more prevalent now. I think it's on everyone's radar. I think the whole notion, I I happen to work in a very diverse industry. There are over 70 nationalities represented on yes. any of our ships on any given day. And I think it's a, a wonderful lesson the world can learn about. And so I felt about taking the subway in Brooklyn. It was the there you go. There you go. Yeah. And so the subway in Brooklyn is another great example. But um, I think it's really... Uh, top of mind now what i do believe is it could still be better especially for some groups Mm -hmm. i I believe it's improved a lot in the 39 years that i've been around but what i also know is it's intentional and you have to wake up every day really focused on making it happen versus talking about it um but listen i have to give a lot of companies a lot of credit whether it's succession planning or whether it's development i mean there's a there's a lot more attention being paid to that. I think what's important is that companies need to continue to talk to the people that they're doing this for to make sure that they feel like there's progress and that they, um, and that the company is making progress because sometimes there is a disconnect in that regard, what the company thinks and says and says they're doing versus how people really feel within the company. So there's still a gap, but I do believe it's gotten better. But I do believe that the focus has to continue and continue to be accelerated. OK, I think we'd be remiss if we don't we don't like going back to COVID and mentioning COVID because we've been there, done that and we need to move forward. But you were in the heart of the storm is COVID, right? 
And then you were in the heart of the heart, okay, of the storm of COVID. What is one lesson that you taught someone or your team? And what's one lesson you learned during that period? The one lesson I learned during that period, I'll start with the latter and go back to the former, is that a leader has got to be agile because there are so many different things and so many different muscles we need to build at different times based on the situation. <clears throat> and I learned to de-emphasize the driven, results-oriented, traffic light, how much business did we book today kind of CEO, take no prisoner CEO, CEO financial performance CEO, shareholder value CEO. I had to de-emphasize all of those things and I had to really build my muscle and emphasize caring, compassion, optimism, motivation, and hope. And that's what I did in spades during that, during that difficult time. And I would say that the one thing that I did um, that I think really energized our team more than any other in the industry, because most were just waiting for this storm to pass and no one knew when it was going to pass, was to refocus the team on a, in a positive way and just, you know, develop a mantra we could all live by, which was the comeback is going to be stronger than the setback and set our set sights on how our brand was going to be bigger, better, stronger, um, more successful when we came out of this so we could stop wallowing in our misery and so that I could get people energized when they felt so hopeless every day. And boy, were you right. The cruise industry has taken off. Oh my God. Uh, it's bigger than I would have even expected. And, and what's the one thing you learned from someone? The one thing I learned from someone is that you can never underestimate the impact that you have on people. Yeah. I mean, I, I did not realize how important it was for me to show up a certain way every day. And I will say that that was not easy for me either, because sometimes I didn't have I'm like woke up and was like, are we ever going to get back in business? Is this brand ever going to come back? And, you know, and, you know, from the book, I was dealing with a lot of other things myself that was hard for me to come out and be the you know, right. and be that person they yeah, needed. And, that, and, and that's what, and I'll leave it for the book. I want people to read the book, but that is what maybe the emotion got to me when I read what you were dealing with personally. And it was just, it's extraordinary. And you, you, you must've been fearful on both ends, right? Professionally and personally. And to channel that fear into action. You know, we talk about that a lot. It's like, we're all fearful. Every one of us is afraid. If you're not afraid, I, I don't know what planet you're living on. You have to be, you, but what, what do you, what you do with that fear? What does Sylvester Stallone say in Balboa? It's what you do with that fear. It's how you channel that fear. And it's just, it's just, it's absolutely extraordinary. And when you guys were going through that as an industry, we were going through it, but we were going through it financially. We were going through it with uh, how do you deal with the employees? Are you going to lose the asset? You were not only dealing with all that, but people were throwing mud on you as as you're dealing with the stuff that everybody else was dealing with. It's like somehow they needed a they needed a bullseye. And again, elegantly, how you just came out of that. And uh it's just it's it's extraordinary. But the one thing I want people to take out of this book is it's hard, there's no substitute for hard work. If you're a ballerina, if you're a captain of a baseball team, if you're an all-star, if you're just the guy that wants to work nine to five, work in accounting, go to his kids' soccer games, be the coach, be a good husband, be a good father. That's hard. That takes courage. So you don't have to be Lisa. You don't have to be, you know, a Hall of Famer. Matter of fact, you were in the Hall of Fame, the crew, the Cruise Hall of Fame, right? So, yes. so you. All right, my ego's getting the best of me. I'm in the Air Force Hall of Fame, and um, but, uh, <laughs> but but but. Um, but, but my point being is, don't look what everybody else is doing. This is what, don't do that. What do you want to do? And then do that. And again, the young lady I was talking to yesterday, she took a risk. Everybody said she was crazy. And now she has a flourishing business. Yeah. You know? And, and so that's the problem with today. And that's why I hope everybody reads your book. I hope everybody listens to your book. I hope everybody gets your book. Because... That's what it's about. It's a, it's about don't follow people. 
Make your own path. Break your own waves. Look, that's what you did with the edge. And, you'll, and when people read the book, they'll understand what I mean. It's like you. This is my favorite story. I'm going to tell this story from the book, if it's okay. Yes, go. Okay, any story. Okay. Well, there's a lot of favorite stories. But this is the one that I was just like, I jumped up and I was like, yes. So many times in my career, I've been told, don't do that. I'm like, no, I'm going to do that. And like, don't do that. And I'm like, I'm going to do that. And they're like, don't do that. I was like, I'm the boss. I'm doing it. And now one or two things happen. Everything explodes. Good. <laughs> explodes bad. I've been fortunate enough that it all kind of works out. When you were just about to launch this new age ship and you were just about to launch all these amenities and you were just going for broke on this ship and you looked at pricing structure and you was like, yep, we're not charging enough. And everybody, you almost lost two executives over it, said, you're crazy. Can't do it. It's too much work. We don't have time. Don't do it. And they kept on slapping your hand and you kept on punching them. And you did it. And it worked. That to me was from a business perspective, like I was so, like I was giddy. I was like, because what they didn't know what you knew. You didn't think about it. You felt it. Because you were reading the reading things, you were hearing people, you were seeing what your competition was putting out there and what their pricing was. And then you're like, whoa, 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 what are we doing here? And so you felt that. You're like, I'm not thinking this is the right decision. This is the right decision. Am I right? Yeah, everything inside me said it was the right decision. And the worst thing that somebody said to me, you you quoted most of them. The worst thing that one of my three leaders said to me was, you're setting us up for failure. Yeah, I remember. Oh, you say that in the book. Oh, I did say it in the book. And I just got goosebumps when I just said it because I remember that day so vividly. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, I'm sitting here with the three key leaders of the front end of our business that has to make this happen. And one of them that was with me for the most most amount of time at that time said to me, boss, you're setting us up for failure. And I, I mean, she could have stuck a knife in my heart by saying that. And when you as a leader have to still make a decision after someone that works with you, that trusts you, that has helped contribute to your success and this brand success says that to you, oh my goodness. You then think to yourself, holy shit, if I'm wrong, this is yeah. going to be terrible. How did you positive then? How do you stay the course and know you're doing the right thing? Because everything inside me, all of that experience and all of those conversations I had made me know without a doubt it was going to be okay. And, and I was right. And I had very little time at that time to sell why I did because we were, the clock was ticking. We were yeah. announcing the next day. And we had to get to work. So I couldn't go through the whole thing like I usually do. I had to just say, I'm sorry, this is what we're going to do. And right. none of them were happy. They all stormed out. Um, they did it because I told them they had to. And thank God it worked. Yeah. Well, you knew it was going to work, right? And that's what I want to kind of emphasize. That's why people have to read this book. It, and that's what gets me emotional. It gets me emotional now. It's like, I don't know how to express that. Because I've been in those situations in my life. It's like, I don't have time to explain myself. You know I'm a nice person. You know I've treated you fairly. You love me. I love you. Just, you got to do it and just trust me. I just don't have the time to explain myself. And in those situations, I know I'm right. I always say 99.9% .9 of the time, I, I don't know if I'm right. But that time I know I'm right, I'll, I'll die. Because I know I'm right. I'll bet my life that I am 100% right. Because of what you just said, my toes told me, my knees told me, my, my hair used to tell me, <laughs> you know, everything tells me I'm right. And you haven't been where I've been. You haven't seen what I've seen. And that's why I love that story. Because I knew that wasn't, it was logical based on emotion and based on where you've been, the rooms you've been in, the people you've spoken to. And it worked. And that to me is maybe my favorite leadership story um, that I've heard in a long time because I, I, and the way you write the book is like you, I, I literally saw those three people in your office <laughs> and I literally saw you looking at them and their love for you is what won out in the end. Because if, if you had a little less love from them, they would have, they would have sunk your ship. Oh because yeah. Those three yeah. people probably 
together had the power to screw with you. Yeah. And, and then you know, people don't know. No, yeah. I thank you. And listen, I, and they would have hung with me and stuck by me, even if it didn't work. And I also talk in the book about building your credibility, like you were just talking about, Anthony. And I had enough street cred that they, they weren't happy, but they went along with me and they did it. And then the other thing is sometimes it's lonely. Sometimes you just have to make that decision and know that the people that you care about the most and that care about you the most are not going to be happy about it. But that's just what we're paid to do. I, right. Yeah. And I, and I can't, I can't, you just said it. It's, it's the street cred. I have many times have I said this on this podcast. Many. It's you got to build your insurance policy. You yeah. got to build because if you had less of insurance policy, those yeah. people were going with you. You knew they were going with you. You knew they were going to be mad, but it's like your kids, right? They're going to, they're coming back. But if you had less street cred, you were going to get hurt. And that's what people don't understand. You're not doing all these little things, these nuanced things, these things that no one sees that no one will ever know about. Um, by accident, you're doing them because they're the right thing to do. But more importantly, you're doing them because you're going to need when the shit storm comes, you're going to need somebody to help you get through it. Yep. And it comes. It's coming. It's it always is. coming. Yeah. Yep. And and it's just it's just it, that's why I think it's a great leadership book. And that's why like I was so I'm so excited to help you in any way I can. You know, if you need me to go stand on the street corner, 70, 42nd and 7th, I'm, I, I'll hand out the books, whatever you need me to do. Well, you're coming to launch. You're coming to you're coming to the virtual launch Monday night. I'm so yeah. excited about that. <laughs> Listen, this is our 850th show or something. Something like that. Well, it depends where the, the timeline and when this goes. I think it's Tuesday. Right. So, so when was the last time I made sure? Thank you, Suzanne. I had the right green screen, and I actually wore a, a, an outfit that was was appropriate for my guest. Uh, hey, let's see. We're on episode. This is a episode eight thirty six. I would say eight hundred and thirty four shows ago. <laughs> <laughs> so because because again, I love the game. You know, I love the game. I love the the player. I love I love that you're figuring out. I'm watching you, and I'm like I should have done that. And, wow, my God, she did this and she did that, and like she's everywhere. And oh my God. It's like, I didn't do that with my book. And I was like, God, I wish you went out first because I would have learned so much, so much. But I'm glad you said what I wasn't willing to do. I wasn't willing to do the work you did. I have other things going on that I, for whatever reason, and it was probably, I don't want to say a mistake, but it was probably short-sighted. I didn't put in the same amount of work that you did to get my book out there. Matter of fact, I just came from a, a speaking gig and my, um, and we didn't sell the book during the speaking gig. And we didn't, and in the contract, we didn't say, you have to, you know, please buy the book or whatever. And then my assistant said, hey, we didn't ask him about the book. I don't know why we didn't do that. We forgot. And she wanted me to do something at the end with the QR code and stuff. I said, no, I'm not doing it. And guess what? Everybody asked for the damn book. Yeah. So she was right. Because and it was then, me being like, you know, no one, does anybody really want to read my book? <laughs> I know. Well, so, so, so part of me feels the same way, but. You know, I, I hope people do want to read it because I really, I, I, I so am so thrilled that you love the book and, and it's so, you know, and you learn these things. I learned these things. All right. Well, if they want to buy a bulk purchase, how do they do that? Well, just, we'll just do a QR code and give the, give the attendees a QR code and they can redeem it for their book. It's like, I learned so much, but yep. that's it. you know what? I think that's what I love about my career too. I have learned so much. I have I have done so many things in our business and now I'm doing so many things outside of the business like this book and now like my next chapter, whatever that's gonna be coming up in my next phase. Um, but I just keep learning. And the thing I've learned in my career is not to be afraid to jump into the deep end of the pool because all you're going to do is learn and how great it is to learn and how great it is that people are willing to take a chance on you so you can learn and do more magnificent things. I but, just, you also, but you also, excuse me, because I just got, I got some one text for my, for my next meeting, but the, um, but the one thing that you do is in that book, it's not self-serving. No. There's a lot of these books that are self-serving. Look at me books. And one of the greatest compliments I ever got was that somebody said that to me. It's like, wow, you really screwed up in your life. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, yeah, I didn't even realize how much I screwed up until I wrote the book. And <laughs> yours, your, 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 yours really isn't about screw-ups, but it's about, it's messy. You said it when you got on the podcast. This yeah. is messy. 
like I, I, you and I have got to like just scream this from the rooftops. It's like it's, it hurts, man. If you can't build muscle without hurting, you're gonna fail. People are gonna hate you. Whatever it is, it's just effing messy. And this book sums it up. So I know we all got to go, but um, we, we you know, I'm sorry I'm not passionate enough about the book, but I'll work on it. <laughs> I'll say uh, two two things. Uh, tune into a uh, messy and screw up the new drive time morning show in uh, Miami. You guys are gonna love that one. But uh, if you want to get the book, make sure you go to Amazon.com. But Lisa, where else can people find this book? BarnesandNoble.com, a local nice. books, a local bookstore, my website, LisaLutoffPerlo.com. Um, and uh, thank you both so much. This has been such a great conversation. Love being with you guys. Really. Thank you. And I can't wait to see what you're going to do next, whatever it is. I'm sure it will be spectacular. Make sure I get making waves. Thank you so much, Lisa. See you soon. Anthony, I'm so glad we uh, we finally got that interview in. Yeah. And it's been so long since we had a chance to catch up with her and to see this book. So yeah. freaking awesome. Yeah, I, I, There's very few people I admire more on, Earth, on planet Earth. And uh, I'm sure whatever she's going to be doing, she's going to keep the ball rolling. I'm sure she will. Make sure you follow us uh, if you've already, uh, if you're watching the video version of this, download the audio podcast wherever you get your shows. And if you're listening to our audio podcast, hey, take a moment, take a look at us on screen. You can find all the shows on your favorite social media sites as well as NoVacancyNews.com. So uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Remember, everyone, you've got one life, so blaze on and be kind to yourself. See y'all later. And make some waves.